Hi again everybody, it's Dr. Schultz, I'm back, and we're going to finish up today with a lesson on target 3.3b, uh, in which you can explain how the mass of the Earth was first estimated in the Cavendish experiment. The material that I'll be talking about can be found in lesson 3 of the physics classroom uh, of universal gravitation. It's the lesson on Cavendish and the value of g. Um, and once again, I'd like you um, and expect you to take notes on this. Now, this experiment is probably one of the one of the ten best experiments in all of physics um, for its elegance and for the importance of its result. So, something I'd like for you to think about before we we get into the math is, you know, how could you possibly measure the mass of the Earth? I mean, the Earth is just so big you can't put it on a scale, and uh, it would be difficult to imagine how you could come up with such a large number and how you could measure it experimentally. And Cavendish, he did just that. And he was very clever about it. And we'll kind of walk you through the different steps of the experiment. So let's start off with uh, the law of universal gravitation, which by now we know quite well. Uh, it states that the force of gravitational attraction between two masses is proportional to the product of their masses. And it's also proportional to the inverse square of the distance separating them. And um, one of the things that we that we know about gravity is that you know gravity is a very weak force, and it, it takes something with a lot of mass or two things with a lot of mass to actually give gravity the force that's needed to be measurable. So Cavendish had the he had a pretty tough job. He had to design an experiment, and uh, he had to measure forces which were quite small. Now the first thing that, that Cavendish really needed to do was he had to design an experiment to measure the value of g. Okay, He had to find the value of the universal gravitational constant. That was kind of w the first thing that he would need to do. Once he knew the gravitational uh, constant, he could use it to calculate the mass of the Earth. Okay, So the first thing I'm going to explain to you is the experiment in which he actually measured the gravitational constant, g. All right, and that's that's kind of the clever part. And once he has that, he can always he can go back and measure the mass of the Earth, and we'll we'll finish with that. So let's take the formula and let's rearrange it to solve for the gravitational constant. Okay, so if you um, divide the masses by both sides, and if you cross multiply by r squared, you can see that big G is equal to force times r squared divided by the product of m1 times m2. And so Cavendish's challenge was to come up with an experiment in which he could measure a force between two different masses separated by a given distance, r. And if he could get those pieces of information, the force, the distance, and the masses, in principle he should be able to calculate the gravitational constant. Now, this is very difficult <laughs> because we talked about the idea that, that like typical objects um, like you know people's bodies or filing cabinets or bowling balls, they really don't have enough mass to generate like large forces. So it would be super tough to measure you know, a force that's that small. Um, Cavendish conducted his experiments over a century ago. And so the equipment that he had was not so fancy. Um, he didn't have extremely sensitive uh, equipment. And so he really thought hard about how to make an experiment that would make this possible. So I'm going to show you a picture of the um, apparatus that Cavendish used. And the apparatus is called a torsion balance. And it consists of a, of a kind of like a dumbbell, meaning um, a bar with two small masses in red connected at the ends. And that bar is suspended by a very, very thin wire, which is able to twist. And the idea was that um, Cavendish would take masses from the outside. He would take blue masses and bring them close to the red masses. And by bringing them close, it would cause the dumbbell to twist. So in the figure that we're looking at, Maybe you can imagine that the, the blues would attract the reds, and it would make the bar twist kind of in the clockwise direction. 
and that twist was something that he could measure. Um, he actually set up a small mirror which he glued onto this thin wire and he bounced a light beam off the mirror and he was able to see the light beam deflect and he was able to calibrate the twist of that balance so that he would know how much force was acting between the masses. It was a fairly delicate arrangement and um, obviously the masses that he used were actually quite small. Uh, the masses were, were pieces of lead, things that you might be able to hold in your hand, and um, as small as they were, the torsion balance actually showed a small deflection when the blues were brought close to the reds. And that was all that he needed. Because he knew the mass of blue, and he knew the mass of the red, um, he could easily measure the distance between them, and then he could measure the amount of twist, and he could convert that into a force. So he had each piece of the equation that he needed, and the clever part of his apparatus was actually coming up with the idea to use a torsion balance, because it's a very sensitive way of measuring small forces. Um, when I was a student, and I majored in physics, um, one of my labs as an undergraduate was to actually do this experiment, and um, we had an apparatus in the lab room that was really probably about as big, um, I would say, as a suitcase and we would bring the masses close to each other and we used a laser to actually measure the amount of twist in the wire and then we would use the information and we went back and we calculated the universal gravitational constant a pretty neat experiment um, and we used you know apparatus that wasn't that much different from what Cavendish used so at the end of the day Cavendish took the data and he calculated G and he calculated a value um, close to 6.673 times 10 to the negative 11th. And um, we've talked about this before, this is an extremely small value, and you know the idea is, is that that small value indicates the fact that gravity is a very, very weak force. But Cavendish was successful in being the first person to measure this constant um, with some degree of accuracy. So this is the main experiment that people talk about when they talk about the Cavendish experiment. Okay. So what we want to do next is see how he used this to find the mass of the Earth. So, um, to find the mass of the Earth is easy now, <laughs> because we can go back to the formula that we derived in the earlier video, uh, the formula that calculates the free fall acceleration of gravity. Remember that formula? G is equal to big G times the mass of the Earth over the radius of the Earth squared. We now take that formula and rearrange it to solve for the mass of the Earth. And on the right side, you find things that we know. We know that on Earth, little g is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, that's an easy thing to measure. In fact, Galileo measured that back in the 1400s. So little g is very easy to measure. Big G was measured in the Cavendish experiment. The only piece that we have left here is the radius of the Earth. And that's a very interesting story. The radius of the Earth was known from ancient times. So uh, we, we, a lot of times in history we hear about the fact that in the time of Columbus people thought the Earth was flat. Well, many people did, but people, um, more intelligent people and, and, and scholars knew that the Earth was in fact round. And in fact, way, way back in ancient Greece, uh, there was a gentleman named Eratosthenes who lived in the time of about 200 BC. And believe it or not, Eratosthenes figured out not only that the Earth was round, but he estimated the radius of the Earth. And he came very close to the radius of the Earth that we now have measured with more sophisticated measurements. Um, this is a fascinating little experiment uh, that Eratosthenes did. It's a nice exercise in geometry. Um, you can look it up on the web to get all the details. But kind of in a nutshell, what he did was that he looked at um, the sunlight and the shadow that the sunlight would cast on a uh, vertical stick placed in two different cities. And the idea was is that the rays from the sun when they reach the earth are approximately parallel. And at a particular time of day, um, it was known that the sun would, would shine directly down on a particular um, place on the earth. The, 
which is now the current um, city of Aswan, uh, because the sun would shine straight down to the bottom of a deep shaft, and it, it wouldn't be blocked. So the sunlight was the sun was basically directly overhead um, on a given day in the calendar. Now, what Eratosthenes did is he went to another city that was further north, the city of Alexandria, and he planted a vertical staff in the ground there and he measured the angle that the shadow made with the staff. And that angle actually corresponds to the angular difference between the two cities if you were to measure them from the center of the earth. So that's the small angle that's in here. So the angle that cast by the staff was equal to this angle between the cities. Now, how did he get the radius of the earth from that? Well, Eratosthenes knew the sideways distance between the cities. That was something that was known at the, t in, at the time. And this is where your geometry comes in. Um, basically, Eratosthenes knew the arc length, or he knew the path distance between these two points, these two cities. And he figured out the angle using the shadow from his stick placed in Alexandria. Oops. <laughs> and so he could calculate the radius. And this is a well-known formula from geometry which states that radius is equal to arc length times angular times the angle in radians. And so he was able to calculate um, that arc length r. And that of course is the um, the radius of the, um, the earth. Actually, I'm sorry, he was able to calculate the radius r <laughs> uh, because he knew the arc length s and the angle theta. And the value that he came up with was very close to the currently accepted value it was off probably by about 10 to 15 percent, um, and it's about 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters. There's a little bit of debate on that because the units that were used at the time were called stadia, and um, it's not quite sure what exactly a stadium uh, unit was equal to, but scholars have a pretty good idea. So Eratosthenes, he was a smart guy, and he was able to get the radius of the Earth quite accurately. So finally, we're going to end now by taking Eratosthenes' radius of the Earth, and you can plug it in, and you can square it. Um, it looks like I forgot to square it in my formula here. So when you do this on your calculators now, I'd like you to take 9.8, I'd like you to multiply it by the radius of the Earth, please remember to square it, and then divide by Cavendish's value for the gravitational constant. And um, you will find... <laughs> the mass of the Earth, okay? And that's a pretty big number, uh, and I'd like you to, to calculate it and see if you can get it, okay? The final value is going to come pretty close to about 6 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. So there you have it. Um, the Cavendish experiment allowed Cavendish to find big G, the universal gravitational constant. Cavendish then combined his result with Eratosthenes radius of the Earth to find the mass of the Earth, which um, is a pretty neat way to do it. So I hope you enjoyed that little trip into history and physics, and um, I'm going to let you guys do some uh, additional problem solving. Okay, we'll see you later.